Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Being Brown and Bold podcast. I'm your host, Jess Thomas. We are so glad that you are joining us for some amazing conversations about stepping out of our comfort zone, being bold, and taking chances. Today, I am chatting with Sam Four, a Sri Lankan American chef and recipe developer based in Lexington, Kentucky, my neighbor, because I'm in Tennessee. <laughs> her pop-up, Tuk Tuk Sri Lankan Bites, crisscrosses the country to bring her Sri Lankan meets the South dishes to diners far and wide. She started the pop-up in 2016 after traditional Sri Lankan brunches in her own home outgrew her dining room. Four's cooking is a reflection of her Sri Lankan upbringing in the American South. Her dishes include her spin on Southern classics as well as new riffs on her family's time-tested recipes. Her recipes can be found in multiple national publications and across the web. In 2021, she joined the cast of Christopher Kimball's Milk Street, which you can watch on PBS. And in 2023, this year, she was just announced the James Beard Foundation Awards as a finalist for Best Chef Southeast, which is amazing. Four plans to open the Tuk Tuk Snack Shop in Lexington, Kentucky by fall 2023. I am so glad that you're here with us, Sam. Hi, I'm happy to be here. This is actually the first interview I've done slash podcast that I've done since the nomination. So this is this is a very interesting time. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, originally when I booked this, you were a semi-finalist and I had to change the bio. Nope, you are a finalist, which is wild. I'm so proud. <laughs> it's so exciting. You and I loved being for ages with me. I feel, I'm pretty sure we met in Nashville. If we met, I was actually looking at my pictures in 2018. At and the Brown in the South. Brown in the South, yeah. Like that, it has been amazing to see how Brown in the South has had this ripple effect in so many ways. And Look your life. South Asian creators are getting out there. Isn't that amazing? It is, yeah. It's so cool to have that. So yeah, there's so much I want to talk to you about, but I'm trying to keep it concise. Because okay. you got a job, you got a restaurant to open. <laughs> no, never so, as <laughs> Tell us, um, number one, we think names are important, um, especially in Brown culture. So tell us about your name, how to pronounce it properly, what does it mean, where does it come from? Um, I go by Sam Four just because it's easy. Um, my name is actually Samantha. Uh, my, my siblings got the more Sri Lankan of the names. Um, I do attribute the fact that my name is Samantha and like that being a fairly common name in Sri Lanka to, you know, various colon colonializations, migrations and whatnot like that. It's, it's kind of become a, a part of it all. So you have, you know, equal parts odd, you know, odd to unfamiliar ears names, but the more common ones that you would think would be odd to them are actually quite much a part of their culture as well. Neat, yeah. I had interviewed Kevin Wilson, who is also from Sri Lanka, but yeah. different people group. And it's like, Kevin Wilson, that doesn't seem like a typical South Asian. I mean, my name, Gus Thomas is also, uh, it's, it's typical, but it's not. Like if you're from Kerala, you would be like, oh yeah, there's a lot of Jessies. So I feel like it's the same thing. People don't expect like a Samantha. To, and, and that to be like, oh, what's that short for? And I'm like, Samantha, like, it's, it's not that complicated. Um, oh, what's your real name? <laughs> exactly. Where are you really from? Like all those, <laughs> those silly questions. But it's, you know, it's, it's what's in a name. It's when somebody you know, tells me that their name is Jack or Chris, I don't go, well, what's your real name? It's right. kind, of, kind of, it's kind of baked into expectations at that point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Tell us a little bit about yourself. What does it mean to be you? Um, well, I kind of think of myself as somebody who just kind of goes through the checklists of everything that needs to be done and, and, and tries to make as much happen as, as I can. You know, I, I keep on telling myself if I've gotten this hard, like if I've gotten through this hard of a sort of gauntlet by working hard and, and trying my best to be a decent human being. Like, it, it can't be that bad. Um, I am a lot more calm than I was in my early 20s and, and whatnot. So it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm a cook and a problem solver with a whole lot more perspective now than mm -hmm. even I years ago. 
from what I've known of you personally, as well as what I've seen, I feel like your identity is love, like love and justice. Like yeah. you love people, but if they are like unfair, mm -mm, you cross the wrong person. Very simple. It's just, you know, it's like, everyone needs to exist. If somebody is some way, why is it your business? <laughs> Live your life. Be a good human being, live according to the ideals that you want to espouse. But if somebody else doesn't want to, that doesn't mean that you have to become a monster to try to enforce that. Yes. You know, everyone has their own path. Yes. In the famous words, why can't we all just get along? Exactly. So, okay. Rewinding, can you share a little bit about your cultural heritage and how that informs your life and work? Um, my family came here from Sri Lanka in the 1970s. My mother's side was, you know, my grandfather basically kind of built himself up from nothing, um, kind of going to a first job as a mechanic and then learning how to fix cars and then learning how to fix trucks and then eventually becoming a, like a lorry sort of a lorry driver company owner and then eventually getting into coconut fields and, you know, expanding businesses that way. Like he, he really did create quite a lot and it was based around, you know, what was in Sri Lanka, whether it was rubber or, or coconut, or, you know, what was available there, what was expanding there. Um, they did a lot. My father's family was from a little town or a little part of Colombo called Manning Town. And um, he was one of a lot of, a lot of boys. And it's interesting because, you know, my mom was in a coastal town, my dad was city and then into the mountains. And you can definitely see there's like a difference in, kind of the perception even even within you know I mean Sri Lanka is the size of West Virginia you know there's that much diversity and, and thought and and lifestyle um, and that much space but you know I'm, I'm definitely Sri Lankan I'm definitely southern uh, I was born in Kentucky raised in North Carolina and I don't know I've just I've tried really hard to kind of figure out what I am and then a couple of years ago I was just like you know what it's just, it's such a huge part of how I think because as the children of immigrants, 99% of the time, our community is other immigrants. And so those are our formative memories. Those cultural touch points are really formative for us. And in a time like now where everything's a little bit crazy, sometimes you want to go back to that familiarity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did you have like, other than immediate family, did you have other Sri Lankans in your community in North Carolina and in Kentucky? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's interesting because a lot of a lot of medical professionals moved over in the early seventies, and so within Sri Lanka, as I'm sure in Kerala, you know how the family networks work. You know, it's very, it's you know, everyone's about two degrees from everybody else. So if you were moving halfway across the world, well, at least you know so-and-so from this area or so-and-so that you went to college with or so-and-so that's a batch mate of so-and-so. And, -so. and um, those communities actually became like very, very strong. Mm -hmm. um, people would get together over food at first and then it would become over weddings, over births, over funerals, over family celebrations, graduations. And, and that is how, you know, communities were formed and so both in Kentucky there is a decent sized Sri Lankan community um the pretty much the OG matriarch and patriarch of that community did go back to Sri Lanka relatively recently but you know their roots kind of remain because we do all kind of find each other mm -hmm. yeah so growing up in the south having one foot in your Sri Lankan community but the other foot in the homogenous dominant culture I mean I worked on a horse farm in high school so it's like <laughs> that's so cool Aww. There's, there's nothing homogenous about how I ended up living in in the predominantly southern white space that I was in yeah um, there's definitely, there was definitely a lot of push and pull and there was definitely a lot of moments where it was uncomfortable um, or made to be uncomfortable, but there are also really beautiful things that I've taken from that community that have really informed both my worldview and how I cook. Mm. So when you were little, what did you imagine your life would be like as an adult? 
I had no idea. I think I was, I thought I was going to be a doctor for a long time. I knew I wanted to have an animal or a couple of them, but that's really all I knew. I never, I never could decide for a minute. I wanted to be an artist or a minute. I want to do this. I want to do this. I, want to do this. I could never quite decide. Um, mm. And so, you know, I, I focused as, as all good children should on my studies and, and, you know, all the extracurriculars that, gosh, I mean, I was doing everything from art to piano to swimming to like horse riding, all of that stuff. And so when you're doing all those things, a lot of things come across your mind is like, oh, I could, I could do this. I could do this. I could do this. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I really I, I, I thought I was going to go to med school and just kind of kind of do it. And then I, I worked with my dad for a summer and I was like, nope, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's there's a different sort of mentality that it takes. And I think I'm a little too uh, squeamish isn't the word, but uh, risk averse. <laughs> I feel like um, my I mean, the, the traditional thing is you should be as a South Asian immigrant child, doctor, engineer, yeah. uh, eventually IT got snuck in there um, yeah. and pharmacy. And so my parents looked at my science grades and they're like, you know, you could. <laughs> so when I said, I'm going to go into advertising and write jingles for commercials, they're like, yeah, maybe you want to try that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I did, I, my undergrad, I did marketing, advertising, and PR. And by that point, I really, really thought I wanted to be a consumer behaviorist. Like, I was yeah. absolutely fascinated by it. I was reading eye tracking case studies and, you know, like, just, just ways that people are motivated to do what they do. Um, really, really interesting in how, like, things were positioned and, and how things came to market and, you know, all of, all of those sort of little things. But I, I never, never, never in my life saw Chef coming. Yeah. Not um, bad. Did you not cook growing up then? Not really, no. Uh, my mom did all the cooking. You mm -hmm. know, I, we were in the kitchen, but we weren't cooking, you know, because mm -hmm. like if you were near the stove with the wrong thing, even if it wasn't for that thing, it would be, you know, oh God, don't do this. Now. So, you know, to avoid the stress, we, we left it to the experts. Yeah, I, I did stirring. My job, because you do a lot with coconuts, my job, I don't know if you had this, the coconut stool where you sit on the floor. Stool. I had the that was Mine didn't even have that. Ours was just like the knife thing sticking out and you do the coconut like this. That was my job because I could, you know, sit on the floor and go down easily like that. Exactly. So, um, did you feel like when you were growing up, maybe you didn't fit in with everybody because your dreams or your aspirations or just the way you were was really different from your classmates or family. Just the way that I am. I think everyone's kind of got dreams and aspirations that shift and, and morph over time. That's, that's a given, but you know, it, it's not a feeling of being set apart. It's a feeling of, of understanding and knowing that you're different. And sometimes it, you couldn't understand why that was a thing, but you know, it did have its difficulties in that people don't understand what's different. But now I think everything that I've gone through in that vein and in that regard has really kind of strengthened me for anything ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that a lot of children of immigrants struggle with their identity. Um, I, I definitely had that moment in my like pretty much onward for a while. I think, I think people really struggle with it until they can kind of come to terms with what they do and, and, and how they can be best for themselves, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I, I like being effective. And yeah. I, I, I like being effective and that's pretty much my main concern most days is that like, did I do this and did I do it well? And mm -hmm. did it make some sort of positive, you know, change? Mm -hmm. is, is, leaving something better than how you found it. Mm -hmm. Did so, you have? Mm -hmm. Once I figured that kind of puzzle piece out, it made everything exponentially easier. <laughs> You're like a big think. I don't think I thought that much when I was younger. I don't think I had thoughts like this until like much later in life. Thoughts all the time. I mean, I was just, it wasn't just like, it was like, how do I do this? How can I make this happen? You know, I like this. I want to learn everything about it. You know, I had a voracious appetite for knowledge. 
Mm. And um, the more I knew, the more comfortable I felt. So, you know, I, I read like crazy. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, as a child of immigrants, we weren't really, you know, I wasn't hanging out with a gigantic group of, you know, families that have been hanging out for ages. You know, there's only a couple of us. And so the friends that you make, the, at least the close connections become few and far between, but those connections stay extremely important over time. Like I have, I have friends that have been with me for most of my life now, but it's because of how strong those connections had to be. Did you have any struggles with honoring your parents versus driving towards any of your dreams or directions? Nope. <laughs> much to their chagrin actually they're pretty pleased with with everything right now um they did not understand when i wanted to leave medicine um at all and it took them a while but i think it's for me it was you know it's like i know that there are things that i cannot do mm -hmm. and so I do those things and once I kind of set myself into that, I was like, okay, so we figure out what we want to do, what we can do, what we're comfortable doing, and, you know, what will pay the bills ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we've always got responsibilities. How do I fulfill those? So I focused on being as good of a daughter as I could, I guess, you know, mm. I, I'm naturally not without my challenges, but if anybody in my family ever needs anything, I'm there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's that level of being present that I think made this sort of career shift easier and more palatable for them. Mm -hmm. um, they're enjoying it now. My mom loves it. You know, she gets access to all the fun spaces. My dad gets to see stuff like he gets to see pictures of folks that he's seen on TV. He gets a FaceTime from Padma Lakshmi. Like he's, he's totally fine. So like my parents are right. <laughs> Aww very it's it's interesting because you know a lot of people talk about they wait for that moment of pride like my folks are super proud and um, and they really did not deter me from this they did ask the questions out of concern like are you sure are you sure about this are you okay you know physically you know i had i had some physical challenges in the first couple of years um i had have two surgeries on my legs and you know all sorts of like i was falling apart pretty early but now that i've kind of hit my stride and hit you know what i can do they're they're all for it you know, and my mom honestly has a little bit of FOMO. Um, she was like the most popular person at a gardening gun event over last summer. <laughs> Aww. Yeah, I got to meet them a couple months ago. They are the sweetest. It's It was so cool because I know they had moved to be closer to you all in kind of their uh, retirement home near you. But I'm sure it's like a, another career, especially with the restaurant opening. I mean, you think about it and, and you think about how hard that they've worked to, to give everything to us. And, you know, that's, that's why they came here. That's why they started it all off. And so as, you know, I've gotten older, it's developed into this respect for them that, you know, I, I don't know that I would have been able to go halfway around the world at age 27 and not know anybody and start over again right. when I had everything at home and everything was fine. Like, I, I don't know that I would have been able to do that, much less I don't know that I would be able to provide for three kids and give them a life where, honestly, we felt like, you know, we weren't the most wealthy people, fancy people in the world, but we really wanted for nothing. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had food, we had a roof over our heads, we had each other, and we had a community, and that was great. And so I look at that with, like, a sort of awe and respect, because that's, that's hard. That's hard to do. Yes. Yeah, they've done a lot. And I think I know growing up, I totally didn't appreciate it. But you're right. When I look back, I'm like, oh, my word. Before there was an Internet, they figured out how to come to America and navigate all the paperwork. <laughs> like, yeah, so Hand many. Things. Handwritten. And, oh, yeah. Handwritten. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like who would have to make phone calls overseas. You know, they'd have to go to you know, the downtown telephone office to do that. And like, it's insane to me to think of how much things have advanced since those times, but you also kind of have to have a little bit of grace because the world has changed exponentially in their lifetimes. Yep, yeah. So you lived in the South and then you were in the Northeast. And for the past few years, you have been traveling 
everywhere. <laughs> yeah, so for good. you, what makes Lexington home for you? Oh man, I love it here. It's big enough to be small enough. It's small enough to be big enough. It's got its charm. It's got its spots. It has the best burrito that I really don't think I can live without. You know, there's it's it's these little conveniences that make it feel like home. It's the fact that I can get through the airport and not have to waste an entire day, you know, doing all the things that are unfun. You know, we minimize that. It's the fact that I can put up a tent in the north side of town that was previously considered pretty dodgy and now have a thriving business growing from it. You know, it's, it felt like possibility and honestly an, an easier way to live. And um, compared to being in Boston, you know, it, it was exponentially easier. We didn't expect to stay here. Mm -hmm. you know, supposed to be here for about a year and then within 10 months we'd put an offer in on a house I was just like yeah it feels it has its challenges it has its moments I don't think they have quite figured out how to how to deal with a couple of things but it has its charm and it has its you know greatness and it has really lovely people mm -hmm. truly lovely people yeah. so, so Kentucky uh, Kentucky's probably, barring any insanity with uh, the state government level, uh, it's, it's probably going to be home for a bit. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And you, you redid your kitchen, so that would be hard to leave. <laughs> it's beautiful. It'd be a selling point at this point. Now I know how to design a kitchen or two, so it's, you know, redoing that kitchen was, yeah, I did it in two weeks. Like, it was insane. And, and it's, I mean, you can see the lights behind me. Like it's very much a centerpiece of the house. It is, it is the warmth of the house. It's got a little fireplace. That's where our warmth comes from. Mm. And your baby, your fur babies. And my fur, two of which are asleep at my legs. Uh, and then one just went over to the window to go gaze. And then three others are in the office with my husband. <laughs> so speaking of your husband, you're in a cross-cultural marriage. In mm -hmm. what ways has you found joy and harmony in addition to like learning because he's he's a Kentucky native too? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, being in uh I'm married. ended up finding the most laid back guy there is, honestly. Like anybody who meets him, he's just he's he's just a really good guy. Like he's yeah. just a nice guy. But he's also he loves my family. And so what's interesting is that. A lot of times when you're in interracial or cross-cultural relationships, there's a lot of educating that has to happen. Um, the nice thing about being in one that, you know, we're coming up on 17 years together where there's an understanding now. It's like, I don't have to explain those moments where I pick up on a microaggression or something like he picks up on them. And so I don't have to teach as much, which is oddly validating. Um, but no, it's, it's interesting because he's he's just adapted so well, you know. He he's equal part Sri Lankan as he is, you know, good Southern boy, and and he's just wonderful. And so, you know, his Eastern Kentucky his Eastern Kentucky roots have definitely influenced a lot of how I think and, and do things as well. But you met in Boston, or you met in Kentucky? No, we met in Boston because of Kentucky basketball. Ah, that makes sense. <laughs> I was like, wait, you like Kentucky basketball? And then, like, it took me about six weeks to realize that we were dating, so. <laughs> <laughs> Aw. No, yeah. watching you guys together, because I've seen you both at different times, it's just so cool to see how much, it's very obvious how much you care for each other and support each other. And yet, no. 100%. Yeah. There's, interesting thing is that there's no competition. Mm -hmm. uh, there never has been. I don't think there ever will be. It's we have always operated as this kind of happy unit. We've we've just kind of been happy with it around each other, and it's kind of based on like, okay, let's not mess up a good thing here. Let's let's just keep it, let's just keep it moving. And and we never saw anything wrong with all of it. And we've always kind of been on the same sort of wavelength. And that's I, I don't think that's easy for someone like me to find to find anyone handle my wavelength much less my much less my lifestyle mm -hmm. so to have somebody who can 
handle both with grace and kindness and decency and like as opposed to being like oh my gosh you're going all over the place how could you to being like how was this how do you feel about this and all that you know his grandmother was a family therapist and so I think he's a lot more in touch with you know how he should be mm-hmm. or how it is to be a, a good human being yeah and I know there was a season when he was ill and you were obviously really there for him. Do you feel like that also helped solidify your friendship of like, we got to be there for each other? A hundred percent. You know, it's when you, when you come that close to losing all that you have with somebody, uh, it really puts everything in sharp relief as to what's important in life and what's not. Um, ultimately, I know that my life is better with him and I'm happy with him and he keeps me, you know, he keeps me motivated when the voices in my head will get a little bit too loud and, and drown out the kind of resolve that I have. Mm-hmm. That's, the path. That's the person who says, you know what, you need to go away for a few days. He knows me well enough to do that. And, yeah. and that's, that's not an easy bond for me to forge. You know, I have a lot of buddies in the industry, but to, to know me on that level, to kind of see the shift in my demeanor, to know that I need to go somewhere now is yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. That's great because he's definitely your you are the same exact team. Like not not even on your team. It feels like you you are the team together. We are the team together. I mean, it's like we're a unified force at this point. We've gotten to the point that we can communicate in eyebrow raises. So it's <laughs> it's handy, honestly. But it's, you know, ultimately when you're in a relationship, you're in a long-term relationship. You want somebody who can understand who you are, who you were, and what you want to be. Mm-hmm. And it does all three of those things. Yeah. Out of curiosity, did you all have like a Sri Lankan uh, wedding? How did oh. you do your wedding? We, we, did a, we did a largely non-denominational sort of cultural-based service with aspects of his and mine. And kept it sweet, kept it short, and then went and danced for a while which is how it should be. Exactly. So uh, Chris is there, your parents have moved back to the area. Is your family a big part of your brick and mortar? Or is it like, this is Sam's restaurant and we're supporting her? This is Sam's restaurant and we're supporting her and what was happening. But Chris has definitely taken lead on a lot of the listy sort of things. You know, I, I, as of February 1st, like I actually do have a full on dedicated team now which is a very different thing you know it was previously Chris and me and my buddy Nuon would help me out for when he could and then we all got busy and life happened and you know through the pandemic and all the growth of the business it's it's been I mean I don't think anybody had any of us could have anticipated any of this honestly yeah like it's just every twist on the journey is just like wow really like I was it's the last couple of days have been very reflective and then even listening to you talk about you know the bio sort of stuff at the beginning I'm like wow really like we did all that yeah. because we've we've just been running for years yeah I like watch you you had said to me years ago I didn't I don't even remember the context but it was something like you know just wait the things that are supposed to happen to you and the opportunities that are going to come to you and that is true for you but you have worked your butt off like between because you were a, is it a fellow for southern foodways alliance i did a three-year the three-year fellowship smith fellowship yeah, yeah you did lee initiative like you have i see this whole thing of like i feel like i should go this direction and between all your connections opportunities that you did not expect working your butt like it is the whole thing and so well you know it's like lucky (laughs) like my family didn't come halfway around the world for me to be a dud (laughs) like honestly how I think about it and it's you know I also I don't know what I want to leave behind but I know I want it to be net positive Mm -hmm. and so those are the only two things that are guiding me and it's getting me that far. That's amazing. But it's also when I get these opportunities that sometimes fall into my lap or sometimes are just, you know, waiting in the wings. I don't want to disrespect the folks who are given them to me. You know, it's, it is a big sign of respect when somebody trusts you to execute a vision. 
um, especially on a one-off, especially unproven, especially as like, you know, out of left field as, as I am. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to let them down. You know, I, I don't show up to, to just show up. Yeah. Totally switching gears. Dolly Parton eats free. Oh. <laughs> Tell me how you originally came to love Dolly Parton. And uh, can I, I go to Dollywood with you is the part two of that question. <laughs> I've got to do that. It's just, you know, it's a thing. Um, I love Dollywood so much. Um, when I was in elementary school, uh, that was probably, this is late 80s, early 90s. Like everyone was making fun of Dolly Parton for her boobs, for her looks, because she looks trashy, because she looks this. I remember seeing her on like some evening show or some interview where she's like, it's okay, you know, I'm doing my thing, you know. And she just kind of, she didn't care and as somebody who's getting it from all sides for being brown being buddhist being this being that wow she doesn't care and she's a blonde lady she doesn't care and then she got to like there's a photo of her and um my late kind of he's kind of an uncle figure to me one of my my parents best friends um he worked for one of her companies and there's this great picture of her and i'm like all right she's family now it's okay Aww. through the late 80s and then just also just kind of following the trajectory of her career between working in music for a bit and and just knowing Sevier County you know I spent a lot of time in Sevier County growing up um my parents best friends were there for ages until mm -hmm. they both you know their their resting place is down the way from Dollywood and it's you know that was a very huge part of my childhood was going to Sevierville, Tennessee for at least the weekend, you know, driving a couple hours and spending time there. And, you know, Sevier County, and I know what she's talking about. I've seen it, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 I love the resurgence of people who love her. I love it. I absolutely love it. But it's also, it's, it's somebody who's not just content to do well. She just wants to leave things better. And so in 2016, when we were talking about hashtags, when we started the business, I was like, all right, hashtag took took flex. And they're like, all right, do you want anything else on the menu? And I was like, ah, Dolly Parton eats for free. And my husband was like, what? And I'm like, yep, I want it on everything. And it has been on everything. Like, and it's crazy. Like, I think, you know, the Dollywood team, like they were, they, they gave her a heads up on the, hash, on the hashtag itself. And so, you know, someday, maybe we'll see. But um, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for somebody who can use what they are to create what she has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I see that in you too. Of She just loves everybody, right? She treats everybody with kindness and with respect. And it's, but you know, it's not, it's not difficult in, in my view, but maybe it is a difficult thing to, to treat everyone the same. I think everyone deserves that base level of respect. Mm -hmm. and, proven otherwise and if you're going to be ugly well then I just don't have time for it and I move on right exactly um you mentioned that you grew up um with Buddhism in your background but you've also encountered so many different cultures um you've seen faith expressed differently how ha has any faith specifically um really informed your outlook or belief system with the way you've lived your life and made your choices I mean, I've mostly stuck to a very sort of loose structure of the Theravada Buddhism that I was raised in. I, I still occasionally go to temple and, you know, I participate in dhanes and ceremonies and pujas and, and whatnot like that. And I, I definitely understand the root of it. Um, the more important factor of it is the sort of self-awareness and understanding, like, exactly what leads to things not being great. And, and finding the root causes for that. And, it, you know, it might not be that the train wasn't on time. It, you know, it might not be that, you know, it was raining that day. It might just be like, well, do, do I really need this? Like, what does this bring? And so mm -hmm. I, it informs my, my worldview and my, my life in a way of like, it makes me question the necessities and, and the cores of things. And, and how do you focus on the core? I'm like, again, effective. I don't want to deal with anything extraneous. <laughs> right, right. So I've watched you and you're a go-getter. Like 
you, I, to the point that I get tired, but I'm so glad you just came back from vacation. So tell me what activities for you are life-giving outside of eating and cooking? Um, hmm. Do you still ride horses? I do a little bit. Yeah, it's, whew, I had not in a, in a while and I was sore this week, but you know, I miss that. I want to get back into that. I like, I like being in the sunshine. I like being by the sea. You know, I like, I like feeling that sort of freedom. And, and now, you know, it's become sort of, you know, there's so much social energy that I have to put out that when I'm home and, and when I'm not, you know, working actively, I'm, I'm become very introverted and very introspective. You know, I, I value my downtime extremely. And so it could be something just as simple as, you know, like scratching the dog's head, but you know, if I take the five minutes to do that. The other day I was like, I couldn't remember how long it had been since I'd read an entire book. Mm. And I read an entire book in like two days on vacation. I was so happy. Wow. That's yeah. great. Happy. But it's like, it's, you know, what keeps me going is that I'm, I'm now starting to see what is, that this is not just me. You know, there's, there's a lot more behind this than even I thought. Um, and I would be remiss to not see where this goes. I, I, I operate off the feeling that this is just the beginning and that's the scary part. What, why scary? Oh God. I mean, if, if this has happened in seven years, I cannot imagine 14. <laughs> you know, I remember when I first met you in 2018, at that point, your immediate goal was to open a brick and mortar. And then I talked to you a couple of years after that, and you're like, I am so glad that did not happen. So yes, why glad. now? Why here and now? Um, this one felt right. Mm -hmm. This feels right. Mm -hmm. It feels like the right space, the right time, the right location. Um, after traveling around, you start to realize like, man, if I had this in a home base, I could really make this happen. Or you see little things that you could make work and, and you see little ways that that places succeed. And, and you're like, well, I could, I could do that. I, I could do that. But more importantly is I think, I think things are getting popular enough that it needs to be more than just me. You know, it's, it's difficult because, you know, I've, I've never, I've never had a restaurant. I, we don't Me neither. Have, <laughs> I mean, we don't we don't have restaurant experience in our family. This isn't this isn't something that we've done or that we do. But it's also it's one of those things where, um, I don't know. It's just it it feels like the right time. Mm -hmm. and I think it's I think it is time for people to have at least a central point because I can't be everywhere at once as much yeah. as I want to be and you know it's it's got to have a way that I can be consistent with what's getting out there while also giving up enough control to let me continue doing what I love to do mm -hmm. is you know cook and learn so do you see I mean I'm so glad that you already have this team assembled but obviously by this fall should be bigger to make it all operate well do you we see yourself I'm I'm building I'm building the actual brick and mortar to run without me present. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's terrifying. But it is what it is. You know, it's it's we had to sit and look at this and you're like, okay, if this is the time realistically, given the past five years, what can you give to it? And I said, effectively, it would make more sense for me to give it passive revenue streams. You know, for for this to grow as a business because there is a and to get to that goal i know that this part this is part of it i just know it mm -hmm. and um you know this is this is one step of many and if this works we move on to the next step it's a checklist mm -hmm. you know, I, I have a handful of things and i know that this can lead to something better whether it's for an industry or for the business so what do you love? Like, let's say, you know, in November, everything is just smooth oh, with tuk tuk snack. And is it tuk tuk or tuk tuk? Either one, actually. Um, with the snack shop, which I love that you call it a snack shop. Um, 
are you hoping to do more with like TV or travel and festivals? Is that like the yeah, thing I that don't have into October? So I'm not going to give those up. Like I worked a long and hard route to get to those things. Um, so I don't want to just kind of say, okay, bye guys. And, and you know, kind of sink off into here. I've got a couple more years before I need to do that, I think. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's so much of a chance right now to make really great cultural progress with food that I'd be stupid to pass this up. And so if I, a lot of it was getting those sort of spice blends and getting everything standardized. A lot of, of these pop-ups over the years are learning how to trust teams with your vision to execute it because I can't be the one in the kitchen if I have to be the one touching tables. And so that's the expectation that we're working off of for the snapshot. It's like, I cannot be the one in the kitchen if I need to be the one touching tables. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've had people accuse me of like, well, she's better promoting herself or whatnot like that. Like, ultimately this is a business and I need to survive. So I would well be good at promoting myself. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I see Manit and her team, like Manit working their tails off. thousand percent hustle. I mean, I have never seen anybody with the level of energy and just sheer acumen that she has. She is amazing. Like I, I think about how, how accomplished she is but how humble she is about it. Mm -hmm. uh, this. Yeah. And, you know, and then, yeah, she is on the road all the time. And you could say that she's promoting herself. I think one of the things that originally drew me to her before I ever met her is she was on Instagram all the time, like taking selfies and videos and stuff. I'm like, for some reason, she's doing that and does not seem conceited at all. She just seems like a fun person that just wants to like, hang out with you and she's yeah. just doing it like this <laughs> it, you know it, it doesn't have to be that complicated and that's the beauty of me is that she she is she radiates joy and like she is honestly like she's the one who told me that I got nominated um the I, coolest video if, if you're listening and you have not seen that video go to Sam's page and watch her on the plane getting the text that she was a finalist for James Beard it was it's so cool. <laughs> I mean, as a, as a lot of the, as a lot of the reason that I'm still in this industry, because there was a moment where I was, I was thinking about not being in it. And then, you know, Manit who knew, knew who I was and what I was doing and, and all those things. And it just it blew my mind because it's, it's how can somebody who is this plugged into the world, be this aware of everything else. And it's, it's something to be admired because she is relentless. And I, think that she is genuinely a force for greatness for South Asian cuisine, all cuisine really. But more importantly is, is she's embraced us in a way that has helped me to grow. Mm. And to have that news coming from her, I, I wouldn't have had it any other way, honestly. And yeah. it's meant the world to me and, and she does because you know she is a gold standard of between the whole brown and the South crew, you know, my, my concept and my business would not exist without them. Somebody, you know, the Preeti Mistries, the Philly Cardozas, the Vish Bats, the Marijuana Ranis, the Shidi Kumars, Asha Gomez, all of them. They all let me stand on their shoulders, ultimately. And so for me to never acknowledge that, I'd be, I'd be foolish. But without them, I, I don't think that this sort of South Asian wave of cuisine that is happening would have had as many great ripples. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, the beauty of all of them is how they have continued to encourage and lift up others, that it's not like, look at me and look what I'm doing. It's like, look at all of us. And there's, it's not, not just us. It. It, it's not competitive. I mean, it's, it's bizarre. Because, you know, we're all conditioned to, to believe that we're all, you know, pitting against each other in this dog eat dog. Yeah, you know, I have never felt as welcomed and as openly encouraged as I have in the culinary industry. And, and granted, I worked in a couple very toxic industries. But with those guys as my family, are you kidding me? I can take on the world. Yeah. Even though... I was never like cooking with all of y'all for Brown in the South. I always claim Brown in the South when I, 
meet people who, who are not familiar with South Asian um, people in the culinary space in the South. I'm like, well, it's because of Brown in the South, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm like, I'm just attaching myself to the official group because I don't we think that have, they would matter. Yeah, like we have a handful that are just part of us at this point. So, you know, it kind of happens. It's yeah. it's always going to be that core group and, and that core vision of, of marijuana and Vish. But I think that they started something that has really led to some amazing changes in the industry. Right. I mean, to have three South Asian women that were nominated uh, for semifinalists for James Beard, right? Would that have happened 10 years ago? I don't think so. I mean, you look at, you look at, um, I mean, every, even, even, oh my gosh, her, her name is escaping me right now. Uh, Sahar, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the heart is incredible because like I'm thinking of her Instagram tag and I'm like I know that her name is not that <laughs> but, like I got to hang out with Sahara at Vicious Dinner and she is amazing like mm. I, I was excited to be in a category with her are you kidding me oh she's magic man like she's got the skills she's got the acumen but she's also got the perspective like it's mm -hmm to me and look at and that's what this is fostering i right. want to i always want to see more of that yeah and she's pakistani mm -hmm. you're sri lankan and preeti was is punjabi and mm -hmm. again you're all south asian but you're all completely different and i love preeti but i would go to war for both of those women they're incredible women they're strong they're brilliant man you know I mean, I, I hung out with Preeti Vas at Charleston last year, and she was like my table buddy for the shrimp and grits. And I tell you, that woman's a powerhouse. Like yeah. not only do you have such a great grip on, on flavors and, and on cooking, and there's something about her that just makes you want to be around her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just adore her for that. I, I find her tremendously inspirational. We uh, were supposed to do a pop-up together. We were going to do, because she grew up in Chennai. So I was going to go to Raleigh and we were going to do like a sabia with the banana leaf and all the things because I was going to do Kerala. She was going to do Tamil. But then something happened with her staff that she's like, I think we're just going to do like a Kerala special. I'm like, forget it. I'm coming out there. I'll be your sous chef because she, she was the only person able to work in the kitchen. So we, I get to do a service with her, which was so fun just hanging out with her. Um, and she's also, that's the thing. It's these high stress situations that everyone thinks, you know, you're supposed to be sweating and tweezing and, and God knows what. And, and yet in those kitchens, you find joy. Mm -hmm. Remarkable. Yeah. As somebody who's been in roughly two kitchens a week for, or two kitchens a month for the last couple of years, like that environment and that sort of mentality to me is remarkable yeah because you can be a great cook but yeah. if you don't know how to love people and take care of people like hospitality is not something that you can turn off you either have it or you don't yeah and the folks who've had it that i've been around in this industry have, have really made it a huge part of their sort of persona and psyche and it shows and, and great reason for that because it is it is a large part of who they are um but you know like I can't think of Preeti without thinking about how happy I am around her mm -hmm. but that goes to show you know there's not a competitive vibe between all of us like I I call like I texted her the second I found out Aww. I saw her name on that list I was freaking out for her and you know it's I want to see more of that mm -hmm. we and rise I think we will um, how would you encourage a listener who is unfamiliar with your background to understand your world better? Oh God, I don't understand my world some days. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just taking, it's taking one step at a time. Honestly, that's, that's my world. It's, it's got its own set of challenges, whether it's being a woman, whether it's being Brown, whether it's being in Kentucky, whether it's being a Southerner, whether it's being an American, whether it's being this, where it's being that. Everyone's got their set of challenges. It's all in how you handle it. Mm -hmm. and so for me, um, 
a friend of mine once told me that even the folks who climb Mount Everest have to put one foot in front of the other. And so when I lose my perspective or when I get a little bit too keyed in to, to something, um, I remember that. And you know, you have to remember that the bad days, you, you've done it, you don't have to do it again. Every day is not going to be that way. And so my sort of perspective and worldview have come from enough challenges and you know, whatnot to kind of put me into this place of, of basically seeking out peace. Yeah. I like to make snacks. I like to feed folks, you know. I'm, I'm not as supremely social as, as folks would tend to believe, but, um, you know, I have a very great appreciation for the community that food brings, and I will do anything I can to make sure that I can be a good steward of that. Do you see down the road a cookbook as well? It's in the works. Yeah. yeah. I'm super excited for that there's a, there's a proposal that's being bandied around right now so i have to make and have to send it back in okay yeah um do you have a curry plant yes how do, do you keep it <laughs> this is a personal question how do you make it survive well in the winter without spider mites and oh i cut it down at the beginning of the winter or at the end at the beginning Tell me your secret. Okay, so you bring it in the house from outside in a pot? Yeah. And, and then I, you cut it cut down? It. Yeah. And so there's no leaves or like there's some leaves on there? No leaves. <laughs> I'm shocked. I did not know that's a thing. It's a thing. The aunties taught me. I thought they were nuts. <laughs> so I cut it. I cut it all the way down. And sure enough, she came back. I'm a, okay, I'm gonna, after this call, I'm gonna go cut back on one of them because it's like all gross. The reason, I mean, my parents, their tree is like four feet tall in their house and they bring it back and forth. My like, mom's like two and a half feet tall and it just looks. Yeah. So, okay, I'm doing the cutting back thing. That's, that's good to know. At the beginning of the winter, I cut it, I cut it back pretty far. Wow. Okay. It's like that much sticking out if it's a smaller plant. Once it gets bigger, I just prune it. Okay. But, you know, you kind of have to give, think of it as giving like all of the good stuff places to concentrate and then push out more curry plants or push out more leaves. Got it. Okay. That is good. Thank you for that advice. Yeah. Um, something I ask everybody, chai, tea, coffee, what's your like go-to or another beverage? Tea. Yeah. Tea. Oh. Um, milk tea usually. Um uh Sajani on our series done some great things with cola goodies and that has made my absolute favorite variety of milk tea uh, very accessible and very easy to make and so that's you know that's a cup of nostalgia right there um but you know I, I make a good cup of tea so I need to be schooled I don't know what Sri Lankan milk tea is so milk tea is it's tea with milk and a bit of sugar and you know that's just kind of the way that we've always taken it whether it's been through powdered milk which is pretty much common there you know refrigeration wide standardized refrigeration was not a huge thing mm -hmm. until the last couple of decades and so it's you know a very well brewed tea with just enough milk and just enough sugar to be perfect <laughs> that sounds yummy i like i as i continue to learn spice to it like there's we don't we don't put as much you know there are different sort of coriander teas and and, and you know cotamales and stuff like that with more herbs and spices and whatnot but for tea it's 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 we focus on the tea yeah the i learned some friends from bangladesh they put evaporated milk in their tea and because again not having fresh milk available all the time you could always have a can of milk and so when they first did that, I'm like, oh, I never have heard of that. Yeah, when it was dessert, when it was like tea at, you know, dessert time, it was with a spoon of condensed milk. And so delicious. it is delicious. I need that right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you say to 18-year-old Sam based on what you know now about life in general? You have absolutely no idea what's in store. God. Um, I was a very heady 18 year old. Ooh, I, I hit the ground running. I turned 18 right before 
the entire United States went to hell in a handbasket after 9-11. Um, and so I, uh, I definitely had some hard knocks those years just because of being brown. Um, and, and by, you know, melon proximity to, to folks that want to do terrible things. Um, we all like to paint really wide, you know, sort of sways with a big brush and, and that doesn't necessarily fit. But when it results in, you know, the end of safety and, and you know, actual threats towards people's lives, it's a little messed up. Um, so I definitely had to contend with that early on. Um, I would have told myself probably to, to, oh man, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I've learned so much from how everything has gone that it's just like, I, I just have to say buckle up. Buckle up sounds like a good, it's yeah. a roller coaster, which doesn't bring me back to Dollywood. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely been a buckle up, 100%. And is there something you would like listeners to know if they are hesitant about making a bold move? No, oh, do it. What, you know, at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, you always have something that you can go back to. It's, you know, when I decided to pull the trigger on the tent, you know, I had a, I had a job that was terrible, but it's a dime a dozen. You know, you can, you can pursue what you want to pursue. It's just to make sure that it's right for you as, you know, the biggest thing, because mm -hmm. you don't want to be doing something that isn't a service to yourself. Mm -hmm. Which I feel like, you know, even with the original brick and mortar plans, you were going towards it and then you had that sense, no. no but I'm you had to like walk first, right? To even know that. Well, it was also, at that time, I was kind of ascribing to what other people expected of the business. Mm. So that is a very dangerous thing to do. I think that's how people get led down the wrong path in the first place. Um, I had my misgivings and, and things eventually became clearer and clearer and clearer. And I, and I tell people this all the time. It's like when people show you who they are, do not ignore that. Because ultimately, your value and the entire proposition, if it's not controlled by you, will be set at some point. It's just up to you whether or not you're going to hear it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think this way is, you know, we're, we're not taking on huge investors. We might crowdfund a bit of operating capital, but I want it to be paid back. Like I don't, I, I really don't like Kickstarters. Um, I don't want to have to keep up with that. But if someone gives me 20 bucks, I want to be able to give them 25 back down on the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking at stuff like that, but honestly, like we're doing this ourselves and there's a reason for that. And it's because I don't think that anyone else can execute my vision the way that I want to. And that's something, you know, it's like, it's the same thing with sharing recipes and like that. It's like people ask, like, are you nervous about that? I'm like, nobody can do it. Like I can do it. Right. Like, I can do what they do, but they can't do what I do. That's awesome. Um, are there any things you would like to share with the listeners about things that are coming up? Um, you know, not much is going on right now. <laughs> not, not for the world to see anyway. It's all behind the, behind the curtain. No, I got a restaurant to open up. I'm cooking for the Kentucky Derby. Um, I am doing a pop-up locally, kind of. I'm, I'm supplying ingredients for Vegan Week um, with Rise Up Pizza, who was actually my collaborator and buddy and my kitchen buddy at Brown in the South Raleigh. And, um, you know, it's, there's, there is a lot going on. And, um, you know, I, I am grateful for every single bit of it. You know, it's, it's definitely, it's a lot but I can handle it. So why not? Yeah, that's awesome. Sam, thank you so much for coming on here, sharing about your life and like personal stuff. And I mean, I could, there's so many things that I could talk to you about, but I think this was a, a, a good start and I'm going to have to come up there and eat some snacks and yeah, let's ride some roller coasters. Thank you for having me. And it's just, it's exciting to see how far we have all come since the days that we've met. You know, it's, it's amazing to see, like, you know, I mean, I love it. You're doing this. This is fantastic. So keep it up. Thank you. Yeah. All my guests have been like so fun and encouraging and just the chances they took. 
I was like, you know, everybody needs to hear these stories because it motivates us to not live in our fears, not think what if, like, and be okay with making mistakes. If I focused on everything that wasn't perfect about this journey, I would still be sitting in my bed. I don't want to do that. You know, there's, it's, life is too short. Life is too short. Yeah. Well, thank you all for joining us on this episode of Being Bold and Brown. I will be back here next week with our next episode. Till then, be wise and be bold. Here's you.